This video is brought to you by contributions to patreon.com slash Henry Kathman from viewers like you. Thank you. The hallowed roads of Naples can be considered some of the most historically active streets in human history, appearing in historical records as early as the first Mycenaean settlements through the rise and fall of the Roman Empire, its rule under Norman conquest, to even being the first Italian city to rise against Nazi occupation during World War II. The story of Naples is a city that often finds itself evolving and adapting under each new wave brought in by the tides of history. Though despite this adaptability, one thing Naples has failed to distance itself from is its long entrenched history with organized crime, as it stands as one of the largest remaining strongholds for the Camorra within all of Europe. Where other historical forces wash over the city, the Camorra finds themselves feeling as constant as the walls of Parthenope. Within this contradictory history, Naples is a city that has long been a point of fascination for storytellers, though few have produced a narrative as compelling as the story behind Goncharov, the lost Martin Scorsese film saved from cinematic oblivion were it not for the strange discovery of a- Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. For those unfamiliar, Goncharov is a 1973 film that follows the rising career of the Russian-born Camorra clan leader Los Tranerio Goncharov, who not only must grapple with the dangerous life of the Neapolitan underworld, but grapples with the rival worlds of his Russian heritage and his Italian livelihood. A struggle made manifest as Goncharov's loyalty and affection is pulled between his wife Katya and his brother-in-arms Andrei Dedanov. While critics at the time dismissed it for being overly ambitious, it is because of that ambition that nearly 50 years later, modern audiences find themselves enamored with characters like Mario Ambrosini, Valery Mikhailov, and of course, Joseph Icepicchio Morelli. All of this is indicative of the precariousness of this film's production, as well as the talent on display in Martin Scorsese as producer and Matteo Di Schiocese as director and screenwriter. Scorsese had only completed the grueling 24-day filming of Boxcar Bertha when he was introduced to Schiocese by his producer Roger Corman. At the time, Scorsese was part of a group of talented young filmmakers that worked under Corman, now known today as the Movie Brats, due to their passion for film as an art form, as well as a reputation for bugging against the now stagnant expectations found in Hollywood at the time. When Scorsese heard that his close friend and fellow movie brat, Francis Ford Coppola, had signed a deal with Paramount to adapt Mario Cuso's best-selling novel, The Godfather, it was Corman who had suggested that Scorsese follow Coppola's lead in directing a mafia film using Schiocese's script. Though, after some difficulties securing the proper visas to film in Naples, Scorsese had to step away from directing the film, compelling Schiocese to bring his script to life as a director, with the assistance of Scorsese as producer. Part of what makes this such a fascinating film from a production standpoint is the ways that it reflects the ethos of filmmakers like Scorsese and Schiocese, amongst the early days of what would later be remembered as New Hollywood. Today, News that a film was changing directors mid-production would be seen as catastrophic to audiences' faith in a movie's quality. But in the days of Goncharov, the movie perhaps were defined by a sense of collaboration, as later seen when George Lucas helped Coppola film the mattress sequence in The Godfather, when Brian De Palma helped to rewrite the opening text crawl of Star Wars, or when Scorsese himself would later seek input from Steven Spielberg when he filmed Taxi Driver. As such, when watching Goncharov, it is easy to see the ways that Schiocese's filmmaking was heavily influenced by Scorsese's style, to the point where you can still see people misattributing Scorsese as the director of this film. Though, despite that collaborative nature, 
we can still see that this is thoroughly Schiocese's story to tell, as best demonstrated by the relationship of Andre and Goncharov, as well as Katya and Sofia. Many modern queer film scholars look to Robert De Niro and Harvey Keitel's performance as a pivotal display of homoerotic affection in a time when Italy itself was facing its first slew of public queer protests and the formation of Fuori, the first LGBTQ organization in a post-fascist Italy. While Scorsese and Schiocese have been both quite open about not intending any queer subtext within these characters, it's hard to ignore how Schiocese's history as a closeted bisexual man might have manifested within the film's themes of tradition versus adaptability. Just as Goncharov is brought down by his unwillingness to abandon the familiarity found within his Russian heritage and his marriage to Katya, it was Schiocese's unwillingness to fully abandon the heteronormative expectations of his upbringing that almost caused him to never fully complete the film, and is widely considered one of the main reasons that Goncharov has been so difficult to find until recently. In addition to Scorsese, Goncharov had a second producer in Domenico Procacci, who helped to provide additional funding for the film once Scorsese was unable to join the filming in the summer of 1972, and the two would begin an affair short after. Because Scorsese was an up-and-coming director and Procacci was married at the time, the two had attempted to keep their relationship a secret, though because of the film's critical portrayal of the Camorra, there would be a concerted effort from the Kimiroski clan to discredit the director and prevent the film's international release. This would lead to them publishing rumors of the affair in Naples newspapers like Il Matino and Roma while the film was completing production, causing Roger Corman's company New World Pictures to greatly reduce Goncharov's budget and distribution plans, two things that would have already been detrimental to any film's success least of all a nearly three-hour international epic whose story has audiences rapidly jumping between Naples, St. Petersburg, and Pompeii in such quick succession. In watching the film today, after Scorsese has maintained a reputation for championing smaller film productions and the preservation of film history, it is interesting that so few people talk about Gontradov within the context of Scorsese's filmography or New Hollywood at large. Perhaps it is because of Matteo de Schiocese changing his name to Matteo JWHJ0715 as an avant-garde rejection of his homophobic family and Italian heritage. Maybe it is a testament to the Camorra's continued influence within Naples. Perhaps it is an indictment against the movie brats, that for all of the praise leveled at them for innovating the film industry, they were still apprehensive of closely associating with the groups outside of the heteronormative white spaces that defined this generation of filmmakers. Or perhaps this is because Goncharov was a product of Tumblr looking at a pair of boots and deciding to make up a fake Scorsese film. Hi everybody. Henry here. I just wanted to take a moment to step out here to make sure that all of this was as explicit as possible. What you had just watched up to this point was all an elaborate lie. There never was a movie called Goncharov made in 1973, nor was there ever a director by the name of Matteo de Schiocese or Matteo JWHJ0715. While Martin Scorsese did direct a gangster movie in 1973 starring Harvey Keitel and Robert De Niro, that movie was 1973's Mean Streets, a film that has gone on to become one of the most influential movies of its time period. Not only beginning Scorsese's lifelong collaborative partnership with De Niro, but helping to propel him to becoming one of the most respected perspectives within the film industry. By now, Many of you will already have been familiar with the Goncharov phenomenon, and in the off chance that this was your very first time hearing about this, well, first off, sorry for what must have been a surreal first eight minutes, but secondly, was there a point where you began to doubt any of this story? If so, when was it? Was it when I talked about this film's premise or its characters? When I included footage that might have looked out of place? When I went into its production history, 
or when I added the story about Schiocese's affair or his name change. Moreover, how much of this story do you think was a lie? 30%? 50%? 70%? Because I did make a point of including actual facts about Naples, Scorsese, Italian queer history, and New Hollywood, all to help better sell you this story about a movie that doesn't actually exist. While this might seem like a silly thought exercise about a fake movie, these are the questions that actually compelled me into analyzing Gontrov and what I would like to talk about today. That's right. You thought we were done with this analysis just because this movie doesn't exist? Oh no, I'm just getting started here. I had to scrub through at least 30 different movies to get enough footage for this goddamn fake movie. So we're going to talk about this, motherfucker! On October 25th, 2020, artist Marissa Bebo published fan art of Adventure Time onto her blog Sabertoothed Walrus, which depicted an original character named Nico a cat boy who would join series protagonist Finn on different adventures, eventually starting a romantic relationship and getting married. Nico's creation was spurred on after the user website jokingly asked Bebo to give Finn a cat boy boyfriend. And like most other original characters created in these fandom spaces, Bebo would iterate and expand upon Nico as a character creating storyboards and fan art that depicted Nico's interactions with the wider cast of the series. But a strange thing began to occur, as Bebo received dozens of different messages from users that all believed that Nico was a real canonical character. One of my favorite things that happened to me, I was tabling at SAC Anime in 2021, um, and this kid comes up to me, sets their back back down, unzips it, takes out this piece of paper, throws it at me, and it's a drawing of Finn and Nico, like, holding hands. Yeah. And I'm like, wait, hold on! You just... And, like, they barely said anything. It's like a group of, like, 14, 15-year-old kids or something that just, like, just kind of watching me react to this piece of paper. And, like, I barely knew what to say. They weren't saying anything. And I was like, oh my gosh, thank you. And they're like, Okay, it's just, just Oh my god, like, that is... Oh. <laughs> it got to a point where she had a folder of hundreds of different screenshots of these messages, enough to eventually compel her to compile these experiences into a zine that I highly recommend. Like seriously, y'all, I've ordered a couple of zines in my day, and this is probably one of the more higher quality print jobs that I've actually seen as a nerd for this kind of thing. Like, highly, highly recommended. it has got, got a little cute, like autograph here. You know, support independent artists, y'all. It's pretty cool. Earlier that year in August, a similar phenomenon was seen on TikTok when elementary school teacher Emily Jacobson uploaded an ode to the character Remy from the 2008 Pixar film Ratatouille. Jacobson's music would then be given an arranged score by another user named Daniel Mertzlund, which would then be iterated upon by hundreds of other TikTok users, creating new scenes, writing songs, creating choreography, and even designing multiple sets and costumes, all culminating in December of 2020, when Ratatouille the Musical was staged as a benefit concert with the collaboration of original TikTok creators like Jacobson and Mertzlov, as well as Broadway directors and actors like Lucy Moss and Titus Burgess, which would go on to raise $2 million for the Entertainment Community Fund and gain 350,000 viewers in its initial live streams. Amidst these two creations, on August 15th, 2020, Tumblr user Zoo Tycoon would upload an image of a pair of bootleg shoes labeled with a tag describing Goncharov, the greatest mafia movie ever made. With Zoo Tycoon's confusion over the strange label, a user called Abandoned Ambition gave a response that would inadvertently cause Goncharov to follow in the footsteps of Nico the Catboy and Ratatouille the Musical. This idiot hasn't seen Goncharov. The post would gain a decent level of popularity from this response, and would then be added to Tumblr's canon. Unlike other social media platforms like Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, the ecosystem of Tumblr is not fully driven by algorithmic engagement, but instead by users resharing other users' posts to their followers. 
This creates an environment where if you can find it, any post has the potential to still go viral even years after its original posting, allowing certain posts to gain a reputation with the user base. Just tell a Tumblr user, do you love the color of the sky, or I like your shoelaces, and you'll see what I mean. But because Goncharov was able to persist for the following two years, this idiot hasn't seen Goncharov was added to Tumblr's canon and would spur other users to pretend to be Goncharov experts. All of this would be greatly accelerated on November 18th, 2022, when user Beelzebub created a fake poster for Goncharov. And in the yes and environment like Tumblr, other users added on to Beelzebub's joke by creating fan art, fake movie reviews, excerpts from academic papers analyzing the film, fan fictions, and also mimicking the discourse and discussions that could be seen in other modern fandoms. As users speculated on the film's queer undertones, the ways it reinforces Cold War-era perceptions of Russian people, and analyzing the tragedy of characters like Ice Pick Joe, wishing to leave the cycles of violence, and ultimately dooming himself in that pursuit. And I once again feel the need to say that all of this is about a movie that doesn't actually exist. But you can see how the mechanisms of Tumblr's environment could cause something like this to escalate to the point where Gontrop has more published fanfics on Archive of Our Own than James Cameron's Avatar. All which begs the question, at what point does Goncharov cross over from total fabrication to reality? When looking through the different posts analyzing this film, interesting patterns begin to emerge as fans of Goncharov essentially roleplay as people living in a world where this movie actually exists. Oftentimes, using terms like out of character or breaking kayfabe whenever discussing Goncharov in the context of this fake fandom. Similar to role-playing games, professional wrestling, and improv comedy, much of the storytelling in Goncharov is defined by a fan's desire to have their ideas to be believable as possible within the framework established by other fanworks. If someone was to describe a scene where Goncharov climbs onto a velociraptor and fights Optimus Prime, even though it has just as much of a basis in canon as any other post, no one is going to accept it as such because it distances itself far too much from the consensus established by the rest of the community. Effectively, establishing a canonical work of art out of nothing. But then again, is that not what humans have been doing for the past thousands of years? So much of our myths and folktales have been established in similar ways across our history where people will pass down stories to their audience, who will in turn pass down those same stories after changing it to suit the values and ideals of a new audience. It was a phenomenon that was observed in Walter Benjamin's essay, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, which posits, quote, The uniqueness of a work of art is inseparable from its being embedded in the fabric of tradition. We tend to think of the concept of canon as the set of insoluble truths that are established when a work of art is created, but in reality, such canon is more fluid than we realize. When people look at the Venus de Milo's broken form, it is widely seen as a symbol of the fragility of feminine beauty, an interpretation that is as stone as the statue itself for some people. But, as Benjamin points out, an ancient statue of Venus, for example, stood in a different traditional context from the Greeks who made it an object of veneration than with the clerics of the Middle Ages who viewed it as an ominous idol. This evolution in canon can be seen across modern culture. Darth Vader is Luke's father, Romeo and Juliet were star-crossed lovers, American Gothic shows a man and wife standing in front of a house, but this often ignores the ways that we only came to those same conclusions through multiple iterations and changes made to a work by an artist and an audience. The twist of Darth Vader was only explicitly established on George Lucas's second draft of The Empire Strikes Back. Before Shakespeare, the star-crossed lovers were named Romeus and Juliet, after being changed from Pyramus and Thisbe. And Grant Wood intended the couple in American Gothic to be seen as a father and his grown-up daughter, even though 
It was a painting of his sister and his dentist. As Benjamin argues, humanity's relationship with art and storytelling is predicated on taking the canon of old and adapting it to fit the values of the society that it is brought into. Gontorov is simply a facsimile of that process being applied to the landscape of Tumblr and the wider internet, where the absence of an established canon causes people to seek one out for themselves, for better or worse. It's like a good and a bad thing with Tumblr because Tumblr, it's so anonymous and because followers are hidden, you can't really see like how many followers people have so everybody kind of feels like they're on the same playing field yeah. and so um sometimes i'll get people that are kind of over familiar about it mm. um and like i appreciate that i appreciate the enthusiasm so much um but also like i can't just be friends with every single person yeah. that likes a thing i made like mm -hmm. it's it's sweet that like there are that many people but it's just not realistic oh yeah benjamin's primary argument in the work of art and the age of mechanical reproduction is how the perception of art has been changed to lose some of its meaning through mass media consumption for the first time in world history mechanical reproduction emancipates the work of art from its parasitical dependence on ritual to an ever greater degree the work of art reproduced becomes the work of art designed for reproducibility when Benjamin wrote this essay in 1935, this mechanical reproduction he spoke of was the invention of photography and film. But through a modern lens, we can see those same ideas demonstrated by the internet at a heavily accelerated pace. Through social media and streaming, the drive to continually present new information to audiences has caused the pace in which we engage with media to speed up to such a degree that it makes it difficult to think about a work on an individual level. There is always a pressure to move on to the newest thing as soon as possible, with the expectation that you will contribute to the conversation even if you don't have anything substantive to say, which in turn rewards those who take the most reactionary and polarized stance on a subject in order to stick out from the crowd and maintain the audience's attention for as long as humanly possible. In a system that prioritizes us to viewing the world as simplistically as possible, the existence of Gontrop is a testament to the ways that fandoms are pushed into competition to see who can establish their version of canon first, which is how we get Martin Scorsese demonized by a subset of film goers for daring to criticize the MCU. How we are so entrenched in misinformation that some people are still convinced that Goncharov is actually real. Or how you have an increasingly larger swath of film history that younger generations are never exposed to just because streaming services don't care about movies made before 1985. Or how you get YouTubers rushing out videos about niche subjects in the hopes of releasing it while it's still trending, and I... I... I think I've become the sort of person that Contra fans are satirizing. There's a lot that one could take from Gontorov, both as a fake piece of media and as a cultural phenomenon. Like, y'all, this video could have been way longer, you have no idea. But I think that as easy as it is to look at this moment with cynicism and negativity, I think it's also important to think about the positives that have come out of this. 
As critical as I am of the ways that social media can hinder our ability to view art and other people with nuance and empathy, it does give us the unique opportunity to view phenomenon that previously took lifetimes to observe just in a matter of days. And it also demonstrates the positives that can come from online spaces like Tumblr, which I think was best put in this post by Anachronic Conda. The Gontarov meme has exposed several really interesting things. One, it highlights Tumblr as actual social media based in community effort rather than status. Two, it shows what Tumblr as a whole values in media, in particular queer representation, strong relationships between characters, emotional catharsis, and dichotomy of themes such as spending one's life building a legacy versus just living life. Three, Tumblr's humor is based primarily in improv yes-anding and the commitment to the bit. And people will put 200% effort into pushing the bit even further if the bit keeps being fun. 4. More than anything, people want to entertain each other. And being in a community that values entertaining others leads to incredible collaborative works of creativity that don't even feel like work to make. In a time when social media pushes us towards engagement through fear and provocation, it's important to remember the best that we have to offer each other through these online spaces. It's at the heart of everything discussed here. I have to believe that we are capable of so much more when we don't shackle ourselves to this mindset of profit and engagement, but instead collaboration and mutual appreciation. And if obsessing over a fake movie gets us one step closer to that, well, to quote Ice Pick Joe Morel, Il passato non può essere scongelato, ma solo scalafito un po' alla volta. Se non scavete la vostra strada, non giacchio di chi o ci avete fatto, alla fine si sciongherai et vi angherà. So here's to carving out that path in the ice, together. But, until then, thank you for watching. Best wishes.